Hello and welcome to Psychogenesis and Psychlolysis by Dr. John Schrage, copyright 2005. In this presentation what we're going to learn is that the polar front causes the mid-latitude jet stream by the thermal wind relationship, but you already knew that from an earlier presentation. We're going to find that the mid-latitude jet stream is going to have troughs and ridges, and that these troughs and ridges lead to patterns of divergence aloft, which causes the low pressure at the surface. Just to remind you, the mid-latitude jet stream is the more northerly of the two jet streams in the northern hemisphere. The subtropical jet stream is not going to experience the kind of processes that we are talking about today. And remember, the mid-latitude jet stream is found directly above the polar front due to the thermal wind relationship. If you don't remember how that works, review that other presentation about the thermal wind relationship. Talk to me. Come see me during office hours, whatever it takes. Make sure you understand the thermal wind relationship. Now, the mid-latitude jet stream can occur in one of two different configurations as it goes from west to east around the world. It can either be zonal, which it means it just flows straight from west to east, which is not terribly common and not terribly interesting. The more interesting possibility is the flow can be meridional. When the flow is meridional, the jet stream meanders to the north and south as it works its way from west to east around the world. But either way, the polar front is going to lie directly beneath the jet. And just to illustrate that, I wanted to show you here that, again, in both cases, I've got a front at the surface, which means the jet stream lies directly above that front. doesn't matter if that's a cold front or a warm front or a stationary front, so long as it's a polar front. Just to introduce you to a little bit of the notation we're going to be using, a trough is indicated with a dashed line, like what you see in Colorado and in uh, New Mexico. That just illustrates the axis of the trough in the jet stream. Similarly, the zigzag line indicates a ridge, the ridge that lies to the east, off the east coast of the United States or off the west coast of the United States in this map. An important vocabulary word in this lesson is vo vorticity. Loosely defined, we can say that vorticity is the spin of the wind. Vorticity is actually an equation. You can define a mathematical vorticity it's actually a number. You can make a map of a vorticity. I'll actually show you one in just a little bit. Vorticity is defined in such a way so that cyclonic spin is positive. So any kind of flow that is rotating in a counterclockwise way will have positive vorticity. Any flow that is rotating in a clockwise way will have negative vorticity. So for example, in the base of a trough where air is turning in a counterclockwise manner, we would say that the trough has positive vorticity. In contrast, in a ridge where the flow turns in a clockwise manner, we would describe the winds as having negative vorticity. In contrast, the area between the troughs and the ridge has no vorticity. In these regions, the air is flowing in a straight line. Now that area may have no vorticity, but it does have positive vorticity advection, or PVA. Advection is a term we've been throwing around all semester. Dry air advection, cold air advection, it just means stuff is being moved with the wind. In this case, the stuff being moved is positive vorticity. The area that has no vorticity between the trough and the ridge is experiencing positive vorticity advection. Positive vorticity is being brought to this region by the winds. Similarly, the area uh, in, say, South California here between the ridge and the trough is experiencing negative vorticity advection. The area doesn't have any vorticity, but it is experiencing negative vorticity advection. What exactly is positive vorticity advection? It's the process by which winds are bringing air that has higher vorticity values. Just to give you a little example here, region A is at the base of this trough. It has positive vorticity. Region B has no vorticity. The winds are moving in a straight line at that location but it does have positive vorticity advection. Air is moving towards location B that has positive vorticity. Now as air moves from location A to location B, it needs to lose its spin. If it doesn't lose its spin, it won't make that straight away and then head into the ridge. It'll just tur curve into a big circle. So we have to, a region with positive vorticity advection is not increasing its spin, rather it's an area where air needs to lose its spin. How do you lose spin? Well, if you're a figure skater, you lose your spin by spreading your arms out. This is a conservation of angular momentum thing, technically. Spreading out is a way, though, of losing spin. All right. Now, if this area of positive vorticity advection is an area in which the air must lose its spin, it's apparently an area where the air must spread out. 
We don't say spread out in meteorology, we say divergence. There's an area of divergence associated with that area of positive vorticity advection. Okay, that's something to write down in your notes. If areas that are experiencing positive vorticity advection are experiencing upper level divergence. Now, if you're experiencing upper level divergence down at the surface, your upper level divergence means low pressure at the surface. Remember, pressure at the surface is nothing more than the weight of the air above you. If you're having upper level divergence, there's less air above you than there was before, therefore the pressure at the surface has to fall. Fundamentally, this is the process of cyclogenesis. We are explaining why there are low pressure systems at the Earth's surface. Notice where this low is. It is east of the trough, it is west of the ridge, and it is in the region of positive vorticity advection aloft. If we tilt this back up, you can see better that the low is between the trough and the ridge in the region of positive vorticity advection. Why was the mid-latitude jet stream there in the first place? The polar front. There is a polar front at the surface, and so the, the mid-latitude jet stream is directly above it due to the thermal wind relationship. So this process known as cyclogenesis has created a low under the jet stream and the jet stream is where it is because that's where the polar front is. So notice then the fronts and I'm sorry that the cyclone then lies on the fronts. Now you can work your way through the whole business of that life cycle of a mid-latitude cyclone which we've done in a previous lecture and you'll realize that after a few days the low becomes occluded. There is an occluded front on the low. Occluded fronts are strange things. There isn't a temperature gradient along an occluded front. Hmm, no temperature gradient. What do you suppose that means for the thermal wind relationship? By the thermal wind relationship, there's no reason for the jet stream to be here anymore. There isn't a temperature gradient along that, co that uh, occluded front. So, the, what will happen? The mid-latitude jet stream will move. It'll move to be above the polar fronts, the cold front and the warm front. So, there goes our, uh, our mid-latitude jet stream. Okay, so, what kind of vorticity is above the low now? None. The jet streams aren't even above the, uh, the uh, low anymore. Uh, how much upper level divergence is above the low now? The answer is none. There's no, there's no positive or negative vorticity advection going on above it. So there's no upper level divergence. So now we would say that there's no support for the low. There's no reason for the low to be there anymore, and it begins to die. This is the process we know as cyclolysis. Lysis is a Greek suffix that means death, so this is death of a cyclone. There's no longer any reason for the cyclone to be there, and it will get weaker and weaker as time goes by. So the life cycle of a mid-latitude cyclone is dominated by the balance between the processes of cyclogenesis and cyclolysis. Cyclogenesis is the strengthening of a cyclone by lowering its pressure, and it's going to happen whenever positive vorticity in advection in the jet stream causes upper level divergence and pressures at the surface to fall. Cyclolysis, on the other hand, is a weakening of the cyclone by increasing its pressure. And this is going to happen whenever the jet stream is no longer directly above the low due to the formation of an occluded front. Let me just give you some quick examples of this. Here's a great big trough in the jet stream centered over the Illinois-Indiana border. That is a big sharp trough. It's going to have lots of curvature down at the bottom. The air is spinning sharply as it goes around the base of that trough. So that's going to be an area with lots of vorticity. Now I told you before, vorticity is actually a number. You can draw maps of vorticity. And in this case, we find out that there's lots of positive vorticity in the trough, which means out ahead of the trough, we're going to have lots of positive vorticity advection. Again, positive vorticity advection is actually a number. You can make a map of positive vorticity advection. So near Detroit at this time, there's lots of positive vorticity advection, which means there's lots of upper level divergence, which means that that is where the pressure should be falling. And in fact, if we look at a map of pressure, we see that that right about the location of Detroit is where the lowest pressure was found. Just to show you another quick example, here's a great big trough in the jet stream centered over the Rockies. The base of the trough has lots of positive vorticity. Out ahead of the trough, there's no vorticity, but there's positive vorticity advection. Therefore, that's where pressure should be falling, out there in Missouri and Kansas, and in fact, that's where the lowest pressure was. The colors of this map actually are precipitation. Alright, I hope that has helped clarify the concepts of cyclolysis and cyclogenesis for you. If you have any questions, call me, send me email, 
see me during office hours, send me smoke signals, whatever works for you. This has been Dr. John Shruggy, copyright 2005.